Coming up on today's Techzilla, backing up iTunes and getting songs off your iPod, HDTV antennas getting ready for that digital TV, an amazing new website, and going for 8 gigabytes of memory. So grab yourself a locally grown organic apple or a pint of your fave ice cream, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Texilla is made possible by Squarespace, GoDaddy.com, and Netflix.com. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the best of the tech you already own. Yes, whether you're a beginner or someone who's been around the technology block a few times, if you've got a question about your PC, HDTV, online security, or the best ribs in Austin, we've got an answer for you, even if we're not there. No. Hmm. Not that we're not there. <sighs> Anyhow, enjoy the salt lick and uh, stubs. And I, you know what? I, I did you see the iPod Shuffle came out last week? Yeah, I was wearing it as a adorable fashion accessory earlier. Which is it's just <laughs> okay. It's, it's a nice. I, I'm a. I've been a huge fan of the Shuffle in the first generation, especially. Nice little bit of music on the go. Second generation didn't sound as good as the first gen, but with the new third generation. This is stupid. If you don't use Apple's headphones, you can't control the volume or skip tracks or pause. Fail even before you realize, you know, because basically, until third-party headphones are made with a little controller built in, mm -hmm. which requires, of course, an Apple chip inside of them. New headphones for the $79 MP3 player are $49. Ugh. Yeah, you know they're going to put that Apple tax on all the accessories that come for the Shuffle and all the Shuffle accessories as well. They get that extra little bit of money in there from people who make the third-party. You know, accessories. This, it's, uh, it would, the Apple tax would bother me less if it wasn't for the Apple, basically the Apple chip that they're putting, making, the, which the Apple tax is the Apple chip. This, if it keeps up and moves on to the iPod, that's it. I'm done. Well, I mean, we had this problem when the iPhone came out because they had the special headphones that enabled you to push the button to answer it because it had this, the uh, speaker built into the headphones I never as even well. bothered to pull those out of the so, box. So, <laughs> I mean, there are third-party <laughs> headphones that those work with. I think Shure, I believe, has a pair that actually works with the iPhone. Um, but, you know, that limits a lot of the headphones they can use right. to, the full of, to the most of their potential. Um, the shuffle headphones in particular is going to be an issue because right. if you can't push that button to make it tell you the track name and to switch track and do all that other stuff, it's pause, basically useless. Or to control the volume. You might as well just swallow it and kill yourself. Or worse yet, are you going to have to like hack your own cable really so that. you can plug a decent set of headphones that into it? That would make an excellent system episode. It just might. Haha. -ha, there Apple's you go. Content ideas. Thank you, Apple. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. So, well, in which case... Gives us something to rant about and you a project. I tweeted about Dell's new Adamo notebook. Mm -hmm. The one that's everybody's. I had no idea how curious people were about the new. They're very pretty. It's like it was kind of an enigma. Like no one knew anything about it for so long. We were talking about it back at CES, mm -hmm. and everyone's like, "Oh, have you had your gotten your hands on one? Have you seen it?" I heard some of the guys from Engadget, I think, may have seen it up at Dell's yeah. suite that they had at the at the hotel at CES, but no one. We didn't. We didn't get to really hold one or play with it. I got to hold one last week. Oh, la di da. La di da. Mm. I didn't say it like that. You said it like that. <laughs> They're actually going to be available for order by the time you're seeing this. They are ridiculously thin, like 0.65 inches thick. The texture on the there's a pattern embossed into the cover. It's very tactile. Very tactile. It also looks a lot like something that you're familiar with. It looks just like a MacBook Pro. But this or one has texture and it's thinner. And it's tiny. And it doesn't have an optical drive. The keyboard feels amazing. The build quality is outstanding. No optical drive. It comes with this amazing packaging that you won't be able to see. Well, actually, you will be able to see probably by the time you're watching this. Not so in love with the 1999 Ooh, base price. That's making me feel a little bit better about my $400 for my <laughs> HP Mini. Yeah. Just saying. There's cheaper options out there, but it is yeah. pretty pretty. Well, you're also talking about, you know, this is going to be faster and have a bigger screen and the lovely embossed well, texture. I would use it for the same purposes. Oh, you would, would you? Well, you know, web surfing and carrying around on business trips and shoots and that kind of thing. What? <laughs> Nothing. I just, I, I actually I live on... I just don't on, need a $2,000 yeah. I do like everything on mini my notebook. notebook to, you know... I mean, if that's going to be a replacement for your old notebook or for right. you know a desktop for some is the, reason, is, is the mini then the, maybe is is your is your netbook the only notebook you're using? Oh, not other than my MacBook Pro now. Okay. I mean, that's my main computer. Also, oh, that's my your MacBook accessory Pro. to your MacBook Pro. Yes, it's my accessory to my MacBook. So this Pro. might be a MacBook Pro replacement. That's what I just said. Oh, okay. Apparently, I'm <sighs> confused. That is what I just said. <laughs>
I mean, I if that's, that's going to be a replacement, replacement for your, your old notebook. notebook. Oh, and we also want to let you guys know that Texilla is recording in front of a live audience at the Web 2.0 Expo right here in San Francisco. The Expo runs from March 29th to April 3rd, and we'll be shooting the show at 3.30 p.m. April 2nd Pacific Time, of course, and hanging out a little bit afterwards. So if you guys want to catch a rare live Texilla, here's your chance to do so. Web 2.0 Expo, San Francisco, April 2nd. Our first question of the day is all about antennas for over-the-air HDTV and DTV. Hey Team Techzilla, Tim from Central New York, looking to get some over-the-air HDTV goodness. Problem is my DTV antenna only covers half my service area. Can I connect more than one antenna, and how would you recommend I do it? Thanks for all your help. There's something a little bit ironic about some of the best looking HDTV content around requiring you to dust off your coax cable and UHF <laughs> antenna skills. I know, I feel so 1977, like I'm this high in beautiful Somerset, New Jersey. <laughs> let's, let's, let's lay down some DTV factage. Ooh. Yeah. First off, no matter what the salesperson says, DTV and HDTV over the air antennas are the same thing as the analog TV antennas you probably already own or are still bolted to the top of your house. Mm -hmm. Do not let anybody talk you or your dad into buying a fancy Or your one. mom. Or your mom. Thank well, you. No, I'm I was saying. bagging on dads. A oh. lot of people would automatically bag on mom or grandma. I was bagging on dads. Okay. Equal yeah. opportunity bagging. Hey, you know what? Don't let anybody talk you or your mom or your dad or your significant other or your spouse or your dog or your neighbor into buying a fancy new antenna until you've tried out one you already own. Now, Tim sounds like he's already been to the coolest site for this on the internet. The antennaweb.org. It's amazing. It's actually, it's crazy. Um, if you haven't been there, it's... The, the Consumer Electronics Association and the National Association of Broadcasters ah, banded together and took advantage of like the, the NASA mapping of the continental United States, <laughs> like the, the radar mapping. Basically, you type in your address and you'll get information on all the TV stations in range of your home. If you'll need a UHF or a VHF antenna, most are going to be UHF. The strength of the antenna you need, even the compass headings to point directional antennas should you need one. Yes, and pay attention to the June 12th info. We suspect some channels are simply going to be out of range after the changeover. Uh, TV frequencies are really line of sight, yeah. especially in San Francisco. That might be a little bit of a problem. Do we have issues well, with that it's, for antenna it's, stuff? You know, it depends on, it, it actually literally, in San Francisco, it's usually not too bad unless mm. you happen to live behind the wrong hill. Oh. You know what I mean? Because they're like, we How do you know which hill's the wrong hill? <laughs> And type in your address and you'll find out. Hill. Well, it's it's really it's it, if it, well, it's one of those things, right? Because San Francisco, we've, I've, everything in San Francisco is Sutro. Like every antenna in San Francisco mm -hmm. is on Sutro Tower, right. which is like this high point. on top of Twin Peaks, and then a few hundred feet above Twin Peaks is Sutro Tower. Um, but if you happen to live on one of the ridges by Sutro Tower or behind Mount Davidson or some of the other littler hills, there's a hill between you and the tower. And then Blocks. But for everybody else in like the surrounding umpteen dozen miles, it's not too bad. A lot of locations are going to require a directional antenna and possibly a preamp to pull in the signal. You can run more than one antenna on the same coax line if you keep the antennas mounted around five feet apart if they're on the same vertical pole or pointed away from each other and a few feet apart if they're on the same level. If you don't do that, you can end up with massive ghosting problems or... Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, Although I guess it's not really ghosting, ghosting in DTV, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Where my folks live in the Jersey Shore, mm -hmm. like right now you can still actually get Philadelphia VHF stations. Nice. That's <laughs> if awesome. You're, you know, you, you need a big honking old school directional with a preamp to get NBC because it comes from up in Wildwood. Um, but almost all, I think all of the Philadelphia stations are all going to UHF and they will all be out of range after June 12th. So they'll be sticking because with the, cable TV probably. <laughs> yes. I or, would imagine. Or satellite. And, oh, the DTV transition, we, we got a lot of emails about this. The DTV transition should not impact your cable or satellite box at all. That's and good. if it does, your cable or satellite provider will have already provided you with something to deal with that. Oh, all this confusion. <laughs> Someday it'll be sorted out, we promise. But hey, we love video questions, and they're so easy to make. Record yourself in front of a video camera asking a question. Make sure it's no longer than 15 seconds. Upload that puppy to YouTube, and then email us a link to your fabulous video question with video question in the subject line. I can't wait to see your shiny, happy face. Still to come, backing up iTunes and restoring your iPod. But first... Hey, we want to take this time now to thank one of today's sponsors, Squarespace. Here to tell you more about them is one of the masterminds behind Revision 3, good old David Prager. 
Hey there, it's David Prager, co-founder of Revision 3. I wanted to come on here to Techzilla to thank one of the sponsors that makes the show possible, and that sponsor is Squarespace. If you haven't heard of Squarespace, they're a web publishing platform as well as a hosting platform. What they allow you to do is basically create a website uh, and, and put it online, uh, and they provide tools that make you uh, able to tool it around to look like pretty much anything you want, as well as all kinds of functionality that you'd expect from any website. If you've been on the web, you can see all the different things that you can do online from viewing videos, submitting videos, uh, having a platform to say things, show images, suck in feeds from different sites you might have online. What this allows you to do is use their features to drag and drop and pull in things, change color palettes and all kinds of design features to really customize it and make it look the way you want. Uh, it's really cool because it does all of the back end coding for you and lets you control just the front end and be really in control of what you're doing without really being able to have the technical chops or needing the technical chops to do the back end stuff. And even better, Squarespace has put together a special deal to get 10% off your entire order for the lifetime that you use Squarespace. If you go to the site, squarespace.com, use the promo code TECHZ, that's T-E-K-Z, you'll get 10% off for the lifetime that you use Squarespace to create your own site, blog, professional business site, anything like that. Check it out, squarespace.com. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Macrium Reflect Free. Making a good solid rescue CD or DVD for your computer can be difficult without the right tools. Thankfully, there's Macrium Reflect Free. It's a disk imaging tool that lets you create a complete disaster recovery CD for your personal PC. It's so easy. Just select the drive or partition you want to image and click on the Create Image button. Select your destination, click Finish, and let Macrium Reflect do its thing. If you want to save some space, Macrium Reflect features various compression levels, letting you balance disk size with imaging speed. Plus, there's the option of creating either a Linux-based rescue CD with network access and GUI, or using the BART PE plugin and creating a BART PE-based boot CD. Macrium Reflect is XP and Vista compatible, comes in 32-bit and 64-bit flavors, so if you want the peace of mind that only a rescue CD can bring, you should download Macrium Reflect free today. Oh, remember we were talking about the whole digital television transition thing? Yes. Okay. Well, check out DTV.gov <laughs> if you want more information. And if you still want to score a $40 coupon towards a DTV converter for your older analog televisions, head to DTV2009.gov. Because who doesn't love coupons? Everyone loves coupons. Even you. I, I have about 40 coupons in my in my. That's how you get into right all now. those fabulous parties. All the part, they're party coupons. Party coupons. Of course. So you know how a lot of people eventually run into issues with their iTunes <coughs> library? And I've since we... never had that happen. You've never had that problem? Not once. Really? Nope. Never totally lost all my ratings you. on 4,000 songs. Nope. <sighs> See, that's why I just don't bother to rate. Mm -hmm. That's just one thing I just never bothered to do. I'm like, you know what? Don't care. I did it once because a friend of mine was like, how do you, you don't rate your songs? And how do you auto-populate a list based on... Anyhow. I dragged them into a list. But anyway. There was a question. There was a question. Um, since we, and especially you, Patrick, uh, tell people to back up their data all the time, which one guy, well, we'll get to that later. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Orad was wondering how to back up his iTunes library in completion. Hey, Patrick and Veronica. It's that time of year again. I've got to reform on my computer. And I'm wondering, how can I back up my iTunes library so that it's easy to import all of my album art and my play count when I reinstall my operating system? I'm running Windows XP. Thanks a lot. Love the show. Okay, so Aura, this couldn't be easier. If you don't want to deal with copying all your music to CD or DVD, which you do when you do the backup the iTunes library function right. within iTunes, um, just get an external hard drive that can hold the entire contents of your library. They come pretty cheaply these days. I mean, you can get one for probably about a hundred bucks, oh, even less. Fifty. Fifty. It depends whatever, on how. Depending on how big how it much is. music you have. Exactly. So you want to copy the entire contents of that iTunes folder, including the Apple Mart folder and the iTunes Music Library XML. Say, say that part about the album art folder again. <laughs> Definitely the album art folder. Did you have an issue with that before? I have. I know so many people who like drag all of their music out, mm -hmm. but forget about the thousands of pieces no, of album art they've collected. No, that's why you have to do that collected. whole iTunes folder because that yeah. encompasses everything, and you won't have to worry about missing anything. That's pretty much what I'm getting at. Um, this is, of course, though, assuming that you have that keep iTunes folder organized mm -hmm. and copy files to iTunes music folder when adding to library checked off in the iTunes preferences. Because if you don't 
then your music could be anywhere. anywhere. I don't know. You could have it because what it does is it makes a copy of the music that you import right. into that iTunes folder. So then it's all consolidated in one nice little location that you can do this with. Otherwise, you know, you're it gonna have an issue. Anywhere. You're gonna be hunting and pecking <laughs> for your files all over the place. So it's pretty easy. I, I mean, that. I found some applications online that will help you retain your ratings, but that should be done anyway within the metadata of these right. files that you're copying over. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Basically, if you can drag and drop. You You're okay. <laughs> You're okay. Just get that whole folder with all the XML files and all the database files and everything else that's and the contained album within. <laughs> and the album art, <laughs> of course. Sorry, I just knew someone we spent like years collecting album art and just. It shouldn't take too. Oh uh, well, I guess if they found their own specific album art as opposed to just downloading it from. I've noticed a lot of stuff, especially a lot of. A lot. I've just noticed a lot of stuff is the wrong album art at mm -hmm. iTunes. It's immensely frustrating. Um, there was a the tune-up software actually that I've tried before in the past. That'll find you album art if you're missing some that isn't already up on the CDDB or anything like that. While we're talking iTunes, we got an email from Nathan. He says, and I quote, I got a fourth G iPod Nano and I would like to do a fresh reboot and start over, you know, blank the hard drive. Well, yeah, no, Nathan, it's easy. <laughs> All this iTunes stuff is actually pretty easy. You just yeah. need a Mac or PC with iTunes loaded on it and the USB cable for your iPod. Just plug the iPod into your computer, launch iTunes, and select your iPod under Devices. In the middle of the summary page, you'll see a button labeled Restore. Hit that button, and you'll return your Nano to factory settings. We got well, a lot of iTunes and iPod stuff today. Apparently there's been a lot of iTunes frustration in mm, the ether. Interesting. A lot of iPod frustration. By the way, when you restore that, you also permanently wipe all of your songs off your Nano, so copy any data off it and use YammyPod. I love that program. <laughs> it's free, it runs on Windows, Mac, or Linux to copy your music off of it if you don't have it saved anywhere else. Very it, interesting. It happens actually. People like wipe out their, you know, oh, all, yeah. all their music's on their iPod. Yammy Pod. I know. I have a Yammy bunch Pod. of friends that do that actually. They back up, they basically do what we were talking about earlier right. and back up all their songs using their iPod kind of as an external hard drive. <laughs> and then they, they go, oh, oh, I restored it to factory settings and now 20 it's gigabytes gone. of music is gone. Coming up next, how to cover all your social networking posts using one simple web app, but first. It's time now for our Netflix sponsored movie of the week. This week, I Like Killing Flies. This documentary focuses on Kenny Shopson and his Greenwich Village restaurant in Lower Manhattan. Like all small business owners, Kenny is a bit quirky. <laughs> and throughout the film, doles out his brand of philosophy along with one of 99 different items on the menu. If you're intrigued by a tough but lovable man who'd sooner throw out customers than serve them, You'll love I Like Killing Flies. Not your cup of tea? No worries. There's like 90,000 other titles available at Netflix, including lots of Blu-ray titles, free shipping both ways to your home, and because they now have over 40 shipping centers, almost all deliveries happen in a single business day. The Netflix plans start from $4.99, but as a new member, you can score a no-risk two-week free trial membership. Check it out at www.netflix.com slash techzilla, and don't forget those WWWs. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, the Vintage Web. I'm not going to lie to you guys, uh, this is a shameless act of self-promotion for my new web project where I chronicle some of the web's most outdated designs. Now, I'm not trying to be mean to anyone, but maybe the added attention will encourage them to put some effort into their sites. The website started one night when I was looking at the page for Waiters on Wheels, and I couldn't believe how horribly out of date the design was. Over pizza and beer with my partner in crime, Ryan Block, the vintage web was born. It's a Tumblr blog that mainly subsists on the submissions of readers who send in links to the vintage web at gmail.com. From the woefully center aligned to the maniacally garish, there are many ways that a site can make it onto these pages. Here are some of my personal favorites. Dog armor. Make sure you look for the squirrel armor that this guy also makes. Web pages that suck. This guy should talk. And finally, fronds. I can't even look at fronds for very long before my brain wants to eject itself from my skull. So if you've seen some horribly outdated websites out there, send them in to The Vintage Web, www.thevintageweb.com. I now return you to your regularly scheduled, non-self-promotional episode of Texilla. Veronica? Yes? You seem to know everything there is to know about social networking. Yes. Perchance you could help out our next viewer, David in Pennsylvania wrote in asking, is there a single application or widget to be able to do one post and send it to Blogger, Facebook, and Twitter? That way you only have to post once and it shows up on these multiple platforms. Mac or Windows version is fine. By the way, great show. Thank you. It's in his TiVo Daily Downloads. 
Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, David. We're fancy on the TiVo. Mm -hmm. um, so, David, since you're using Blogger, your options are a little more limited, but mm -hmm. still good. Now, I didn't realize he was looking for an actual desktop application. application, but there's tons of web options out there for you that'll work just as well, and then you can kind of use them on the go or whenever you want to. You don't have to worry about that whole being tied to your computer scenario. I'm just going to tailor it for that. Uh, Ping FM seems to be the de facto choice for most people, and it has your blogger needs covered. You can update about a million different ways from either IM, text messaging, or even email, or just by visiting the ping.fm site and typing in your status update. Your status update. That's not a music site? Ping, no, that's blip.fm. Thank you. Ping.fm is different. That's music. How many, anyway. how many social networking sites are you on at any given Me? moment? Me? Oh, gosh. I don't want to ask. That's a, that's a topic for a different day. Um, anyhow, uh, then you can choose which other social networks you want Ping to relay that message to. For everyone else out there, um, hellotext.com is another microblogging syndication tool, but it won't resyndicate re to Blogger, actually. Mm. I, I'm pretty sure. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see that listed in their available networks that they'll push content to. Um, you can even schedule when you want your updates to go out, which is cool. It's kind of like Tumblr in that way. You can, right. you know, queue posts or up, that kind of thing. Web or any other web, you know, Content CMS tool, yeah. out there that you can schedule posts on. Um, there are also numerous third-party apps that will cross-post between Facebook and Twitter. Blogger is kind of the wild card. Uh, so in there. If, if you take Blogger out of the equation, it, there's, there's like, like a billions bazillion. of things that you could do. Yeah. Applications, TweetDeck is actually going to start having Facebook Connect. Really? Functionality that will work soon. Then also, hey, isn't it weird how Facebook Connect is really becoming the like the one that everyone uses? They're not using the Google one; they're using Facebook. I wonder why. I've never actually logged into Facebook. Re what really? Yeah. Do you even have a Facebook? No. Oh, we'll make one for you later. So anyway, <laughs> Ping is probably the best option for you, David. Um, I'll have to look up actual desktop applications at some point and see what else is out there that works with Blogger. Because like I said, it's kind of the wild socializer card. is desktop or web. Web. There you go. More to come, including more of your viewer questions. Memory, people. It's all about eight glorious gigabytes. GoDaddy.com, people. You think you're smarter than the rest? Prove it and you could win big. If smart space from GoDaddy.com has changed the way you use the internet, the way you blog, the way you do your business, the way you live your life, create a blog or video story that shows just how. You might win $25,000 in cash prizes and free smart space for life. Head on over to GoDaddy.com slash SS Contest and enter now. Don't have smart space? See what it's all about and save an additional 15% through April 15, 2009. Use the promo code SPACE15. Please support Techzilla by supporting our sponsors. Looking for a magical blend of taste and refreshment? Then my custom tea, Veronica's Berry Zinger, is just the thing. Check it out at www.adagio.com slash Texilla. Adagio also has teapots, teaware, and tons of other unique loose leaf teas. A tin of Veronica's Berry Zinger and an Ingenuity teapot would make for a delightful gift for Grandpa. <laughs> Get your tea on at www.adagio.com slash Texilla. Patrick recently asked you, our beloved Texilla audience, how you organize your photo collections after spending a fair chunk of time organizing a few years of photos. I'm still waiting through the giant dog pile of responses. The response was epic. A lot of you love iPhoto and Picasa, but a lot of you can, well, I, Paul actually kind of sums up what a lot of you had to say. iPhoto, seriously, iPhoto, or Aperture, or Lightroom. Organizing by files is so old school in last century. It's time to move forward into the future by harnessing the power of the database. <laughs> It's the difference between thinking about items individually versus thinking about them as part of a collection. Let iPhoto worry about where files go and how they're organized on your hard drive. If you ever need the actual file, you can always show file. It's a nifty little command. Now, using a database, <laughs> you can create multiple albums using the same photo and quickly search all of your photos using a variety of options. Point taken, Paul. Now I just need to get over my A, total hatred of iPhoto, or B, save up $300 for Lightroom. I hate iPhoto. I use it and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Hate Lightroom's it. pretty slick. It's, it's not a replacement for Photoshop, it's a companion. It is, like Aperture, essentially designed to organize giant collections of photos. It just seems a little bit like using the dump truck to move, you know, a bucket of suds. Whatever that metaphor came from. Anyhow, I'll also sum up some of my favorite old school folder based responses because a lot of you just stack your folders uh, next week. And also, a lot of folks are big on ITPC over EXIF for file tagging, which actually is an entirely fascinating conversation that I'm not going to bore you with today. Sounds good. Question? Yeah, we have another question. 
The question is, I have a system that I built a few months ago that I'm looking to upgrade. I reused two gigabytes of memory from my old system. I can pick up four gigabytes of DDR2800 CL4 for about the same price as eight gigabytes of DDR2800 CL5. Which should I choose from Nick? It all comes down to operating system. Mm. If you're going to run a 32-bit mm. version of Windows, eh. If you're going to run a 64-bit, no, actually, you know what, it, 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 scratch that. 64, 32-bit, 32 32-bit's 32 not going to see it, but you're going to be moving to a 64-bit operating system soon. Just go with the 8 gigabytes, no questions. I don't think you're ever, except outside of a benchmark, going to notice the difference between CAS4 and CAS5. It's like, oh, it's got a lower latency, it's going to be so epically fast. No, you're not going to notice. But even Vista, after a couple tweaks, will do sick and amazing things with 8 gigabytes of RAM, especially if you work with big, memory-hungry application. Think lots less accessing the hard drive. And for everybody out there who's like, eight gigabytes of RAM, that's gotta cost a fortune. We're talking like 60 or 120 bucks. I bought four gigabytes of RAM last week for 45 bucks. Wow, where? Branded RAM. Where? From Fry's. Fries. Not exactly known for their low, low prices. In fact, their prices, actually their prices are getting more competitive. Mm. They're obviously terrified of the big box store shutting down. Yeah, syndrome. they don't What's want the Circuit on. City Syndrome. That would be bad. Or the CompUSA Syndrome. Oh, geez. Man, yeah. a lot of them are going, what's wrong? Nothing. I'm just thinking sad thoughts about the you fact just, that... I just saw your eyes, like, unfocused, and you kind of, like, went, like, ah. I just... I, I, like, I didn't know you felt so emotional about these big box stores. It's just, you know, I have a lot of... I, have a, I had a long-standing love-hate relationship with CompUSA. Yeah. And with we Circuit City, it was mostly a hate-hate relationship, but it was there. <laughs> you know, it... For everybody watching, like, we live on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech health, product reviews, how-tos, you ask us, we'll do it, but we need your emails. So don't be shy, send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Or even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. Oh, hey, Indignation was live at South by Southwest, and even if you couldn't go to South by Southwest, in. <coughs> <coughs> Hope you enjoyed uh, the Salt Lake people. Yeah, well, you guys don't have to miss it. Check out Dignation releases past Wednesday to see the mayhem of Dignation live at South by Southwest. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, <laughs> you've been watching Techzilla.